Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to today's episode of M Patient Myeloma Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom. Now, if you'd like to receive a weekly email about past and upcoming interviews, you can subscribe to our Inpatient Minute newsletter on the homepage or follow us there on Facebook or Twitter. And please share these interviews with your myeloma friends. We have a new site called myelomacrowd.org. That's the first all-inclusive site for myeloma. And we invite you to contribute to the site. If you'd like to contribute a post on your experience or your perspective with myeloma, click on Become a Contributor. And we've just added all the Mayo Clinic and Memorial Sloan Kettering doctors to the Myeloma Specialist Directory. So take a look at that growing directory. Now today we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Stephen Harding of the Binding Site Group in the UK. Now most myeloma patients know they have either kappa or lambda myeloma. And this is detected with the free light test from the Binding Site Group. But testing the heavy part of the chain also may give us more information and may be very important in detecting minimal residual disease. Several patients requested this interview because we focused on the importance of diagnostic to, diagnostics to get more personalized care. So, Dr. Harding, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us on the show. Uh, thank you very much, Jenny. It's a real pleasure to be here. Well, let me introduce you for a bit. Um, Dr. Stephen Harding is the research director of the Binding Site Group. Dr. Harding spent the majority of his professional career developing monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies. These antibodies have been used in immunotherapies and immunodiagnostics. Dr. Harding is passionate about proteins and assay development and has been instrumental in the launch of the Heavy Light, this new IVD assay for the quantification of Ig kappa and Ig lambda serum immunoglobulins. In addition, Dr. Harding has been instrumental in launching approximately 20 other assays. Currently, he runs a team of 60 R&D scientists and a regulatory affairs department with keen interest in 510K FDA submissions. Dr. Harding has contributed to many articles in peer-reviewed journals and tens of published abstracts. So thank you again for joining us. Um, Maybe we should start with just a little bit of background and history on your current role with the binding site. Sure. So I joined the binding site in uh, 2006, and my main responsibility was to organize the early clinical trials looking at the efficacy and the utility of free light. After around about uh, six months, I was then given the opportunity to start to develop an entirely new assay, the heavy light assay, and I developed that from 2007 until launch, and, and the assay has just received FDA approval both for IgG heavy light, IgA heavy light, and IgM heavy light. In 2011, I became the Director of Research and Development, and that role gives me the opportunity to liaise with myeloma physicians and myeloma experts and meet myeloma patients worldwide. And I'm delighted to be able to have the opportunity to share with you our thoughts on the free light assay and on the heavy light assay. Can you tell us about the free light assay when that um, was developed? Sure. The the, the free light assay was uh, developed and launched back in 2001. And I I, I think you started by saying all my all myelomas is either kappa or lambda. I think if we if we go a little bit further back, myeloma is a cancer associated with plasma cells. And plasma cells produce antibodies. Um, we, as, as, as mammals, produce a huge array of antibodies. In, in the Anderson and Anderson publication in 2002, they said there were over a million different individual antibodies in, in the human body. These antibodies have a heavy chain. The, the most common is IgG. It could be uh, an IgA or IgM, and a light chain, either kappa or lambda. The light chain marrying to the heavy chain to make a functional antibody is quite an inefficient process, and the light chains are produced in excess. We think about in 40% excess compared to the heavy chain. These light chains were able to be detected in serum by the free light assay for the first time, and the assay identifies a 
hidden epitope. So when you have your light chain and heavy chain pair together, there is an epitope that's hidden and it's only visible when the light chain is free. Over 90% of myeloma patients have an abnormally elevated free light chain. And these are unique to the patient. So as Anderson Anderson showed us, there are a million different possibilities with your immunoglobulins. And so there are millions of different possibilities of your light chains. And these light chains are very individual. The free light assay uses a polyclonal antibody technology, which is the only method that allows recognition of all of these unique molecules. Okay, so that makes sense that it's testing for a wide range of all the antibodies that your body produces, not just one. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the monoclonal versus polyclonal, I think, a little bit later. Um, can you give us a little bit of history before we get started into the details about the mission and goals of the binding site? So the binding site is committed to improving patient lives worldwide. And the way we do that is through a process of education, collaboration, and innovation. It's been my real pleasure to have worked with organizations in, in, in the U.S., such as Mayo Clinic, Arkansas, Dana-Farber, Sloan Kettering, the NIH, and support clinical studies which look into the utility of our assays. I think as a soundbite, we may think about it in, in this sort of terms. Individuals may beat cancer, which is, which is absolutely amazing, but we believe together collaborations between scientists, clinicians, laboratorians, and patients will actually conquer it, and that's what gets me out of bed at 5.30 each morning. Okay, thank you. And can you also share a little bit about your personal background? We talked a little bit before the show started, but I think others would be interested as well. Sure. So I'm a biochemist by trade, and, and if during the course of our interview I start talking uh, in too technical <laughs> terms, please feel free to interrupt. Um, I started my career making antibodies to the heat shock proteins, which are stress proteins uh, known to be elevated in, in several different uh, diseases. And indeed, HSB90 has been, or an anti uh, a treatment targeting HSB90 has been uh, evaluated in myeloma for some time. I then moved to the University of Leicester um, to study a postdoc looking at signaling pathways. And again, I, I, I was making antibodies against P38 and, and junk kinase signaling proteins. I then moved into biotechnology. I started making antibodies that were specific for different carbohydrate moieties on colorectal cancers. And these antibodies were used in therapeutics. Um, the company that I was working for at that time sold the antibodies to a larger company, and I had the opportunity to join binding sites. My career has really been spent in and around the association of proteins and antibodies and how they can be used either as therapeutics or as diagnostics. Well, I would think with the really recent push in antibodies that you would be very excited right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Seems, I think that the... Yeah. Sorry. No, it seems like the monoclonal antibodies are just beginning to become more popular and more exciting. Absolutely. I think in, in the setting of myeloma, the daratuzumab and elotuzumab, um Really, the early work uh, that has been done in the, with these monoclonals looks very exciting. I've been fortunate to be able to attend meetings where clinicians have discussed these advances. Um, monoclonal antibody therapeutics, or the idea behind monoclonal antibody therapeutics, is not new. For me, back in the 1980s, we, we spoke about a magic bullet approach, and antibodies have uh, radioactivity or other chemotherapies bound to them. And really, we were we were quite naive at that time because the the hypotheses and the um, delivery were somewhat disjointed. We are now much better at identifying the monoclonal antibody targets, and this can be seen with the um, anti-CD38 target uh, with daratuzumab, of course. Um, and so these are starting to have genuine 
therapeutic um, therapeutic uh, uses. I think the most famous antibody, of course, that, that, that is used is rituximab, which has revolutionized CLL patient treatment. My real hope is that the current batch of antibodies that are being evaluated in myeloma have a similar impact in patient outcome. Well, and maybe your test will help help determine that. So let's talk about your tests for a minute. We always push patients to ask about the tests, the important tests that they should be getting. I think the free light test pretty much everyone gets, but I think there are patients that might still not know exactly what that test is telling them. So can you give us a layperson's um, description of first the free light test and why it's important and what it tells you as a patient? Okay, so the, the, the free light assay measures the amount of kappa light chain and lambda light chain in serum. And as we were discussing earlier, these light chains form part of your immunoglobulin molecule but are produced in excess. The light chain assay was revolutionary because for the first time it allowed us to quantify what a normal kappa and lambda light chain component looked like in a healthy human um, in, in a healthy human serum and looking at that and this was work with the Mayo Clinic we were able to develop a normal range for kappa and for lambda and a normal ratio of kappa to lambda which allowed us to then evaluate whether there was an abnormal production and of course before you can know what abnormal is, we have to have a very well described normal range, uh, normal population that was completed by uh, Professor Jerry Katzman on 282 normal human sera. They then evaluated the test in disease states, and the first disease that was looked at was non-secretory myeloma. This was work by Professor Mark Drayson from the MRC, and he showed that in a disease that had previously been thought to be, be producing no monoclonal proteins, the free light assay allowed the detection of monoclonal proteins because of the disturbance in the kappa to lambda ratio. The assay was, um, was then evaluated in AL amyloidosis, and in fact, it was in AL amyloidosis that it, was, it received its first international guidelines and that was back in 2005 with a consensus opinion for AL amyloidosis being published by Jerry, uh, sorry, by Maury Gertz. I think that the real sensitivity of the assay is in being able to distinguish disease from normal. And the reason why this was not possible before is because previously the monoclonal light chains had only been able to be detected in urine. In fact, it was the detection in urine many, many years ago by Dr. Bence Jones that led to the name nomenclature, and people still use this nomenclature, as Bence Jones proteins. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And now, as you have been in this space for a long time and then started to develop, how did you begin to develop the heavy light chain test, and what was the process to, to go through that? So heavy light, we, first, we, we were first looking at how free light is, is provided utility in the clinical chemistry setting. And the individual assays, either kappa or lambda, provided some utility, but the sensitivity of the assay was in looking at the ratio of kappa to lambda, and it's the understanding that your kappa could be either monoclonal, so a single clone producing kappa, and the, the level of your lambda then gives you an indication of your polyclonal or normal immunoglobulin repertoire. And so we thought that if we were able to provide a sensitive understanding of the patient's light change using this kappa-lambda ratio, if we were able to advance that and start looking at an assay that measured IgG kappa and an assay that measured IgG lambda, then you would be able to have, or produce rather, an IgG kappa, IgG lambda ratio, and that may be more sensitive than the current technologies. 
you would then move this to IgA kappa and IgA lambda, IgM kappa and IgM lambda. The assay used similarly, similar to the free light assay, uses polyclonal antibodies because the immunoglobulins that we're recognizing are all individual. And we have targeted an area in the immunoglobulin in the what we call the constant region of the immunoglobulin. And so the assay that rec recognizes all possible immunoglobulins, which means we can monitor and measure all possible myeloma or monoclonal immunoglobulins. It, it uses a, a pool of myeloma proteins as an immunogen and a larger pool of myeloma proteins to purify and each of our batches of, of heavy light are thousands of immunizations um, and thousands of different proteins in, in size. Well, let me ask a question. When you talk about the ratio between kappa and lambda, I've had some doctors say, oh, you, you should really not necessarily consider the different um, levels of the kappa or lambda when you're looking at that free light test, but just focus on the ratio. And then I've had other doctors say, no, you need to look at the ratio and the other level, the actual level of the kappa or the lambda. That it, I'm not sure exactly, I'm not very clear on which is the right answer. So maybe I should ask you because you are the creator of the test. <laughs> okay, okay. And this, in fact, is a very common uh, question that we get asked. The kappa lambda ratio is a very useful a, a very useful marker of clonality, so it is able to distinguish between normal and monoclonal. It, in, in the setting of a screening tool, one would use an abnormal kappa lambda ratio to identify a patient with perhaps monoclonal process. In monitoring the patient you would look to use either the involved, i.e. the clonally produced kappa or lambda, or a difference between the involved and the uninvolved. So you would use the absolute measurements. Somewhat confusingly, as the patient has a very, very good response and has a complete response, we then go back to looking at the kappa lambda ratio in order to assign what is called a stringent complete response. So I'm afraid the answer is we use the ratio at presentation and at maximum response, and to monitor the patient, you use the monoclonally produced light chain. Oh, well, that makes sense. So the answer is they're both right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a the sensitivity of just using the kappa or just using the lambda without the ratio would would be limited. It would still be a very useful test, but it would be it would, it would be much more limited. And the ratio is really an exquisite tool at identifying monoclonal processes at presentation. Indeed, the work by Jerry Katzman and Mayo Clinic suggests the algorithm of free light looking at an abnormal ratio and serum protein electrophoresis is the most cost-effective algorithm for identifying all monoclonal gammopathies. So the free light, when you talk about minimal residual disease, and I know we'll go on to talk about that later in the show, but just to address it a little bit, um, the free light test would be pretty instrumental then in monitoring min minimal residual disease if, you're, if the ratio you're talking about is um, how well you responded, basically. Is that correct? Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, absolutely. The International Myeloma Working Group have identified that the free light chain ratio alongside flow cytometry at maximum response can be used to assign stringent complete response. And this is a a, a greater depth of response than just looking at immunofixation negativity, which was the standard assessment of complete response. Earlier this year, Kapoor from the Mayo Clinic published that the achievement of a stringent complete response was associated with a superior outcome 
compared to standard immunofixation response. The, okay. international, the, the international Myeloma Foundation have got a Cure Myeloma Initiative, the Black Swan Research Initiative, and they have included both free light and heavy light as markers of response alongside flow cytometry, PET, etc., and, and, and as markers of the depth of response. And there have been other, there have been several publications at ASH, at a, the European Hematology Association meetings, which have been, which have shown that the depth of response measured by free light and heavy light may be superior to standard serum electrophoresis responses. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's good to know. So let's talk a little bit more about the new test. Um, I'm not sure that I still understand exactly how it works or what it tests for and what it tells us. So can you go into a little more depth about that test? Okay. So each individual component of the heavy light assay identifies a intact immunoglobulin, a heavy chain, and its light chain partner. So mm -hmm. in myeloma terms, you may have heard patients say that they have an IgG kappa myeloma. And this is because they have a, an IgG heavy chain and a kappa light chain. The assay quantifies the IgG kappa, and a second assay will quantify the IgG lambda. And so you were, are able to get a specific IgG kappa, IgG lambda ratio. Why this may be important is we were talking earlier about the light chain ratio being a very sensitive marker at, uh, of, of um, disease at diagnosis and a very sensitive marker at complete response because it gives you an indication of both the production of the monoclonal immunoglobulin, the diseased uh, disease state immunoglobulin, and also the normal polyclonal immunoglobulin. And the heavy light chain assay builds on that relationship. Where it may be used is that monitoring patients with myeloma can be very difficult for labor laboratorians. And this is because current assays, such as serum electrophoresis, can be interfered with by other proteins. The, the IgA monoclonal protein migrates into a position where there are numerous other serum proteins, and this can make life very difficult for the laboratory. We call it co-migration, and it can occur in between 30 to 50% of all IgA monoclonal proteins. In addition, the monoclonal proteins may be very diffuse and difficult to identify, and so we know that the changes in monoclonal protein load give the physician a really great insight into whether the patient is responding to treatment or not. If we are not accurate in our quantification of those changes, then we may either have an underestimation or an overestimation of response. Mm. The heavy light assay it does not have the same interference and so it gives a very accurate measure of the monoclonal protein load. Okay, so it's determining response levels, again, at a deeper level. So if the ratio is important, and I know there are a variety of combinations, so you can have IgG, uh, kappa, or lambda, or you can have IgA, kappa, or lambda, or you can have IgM, so there are, you know, I don't know how many that totals, but there are like eight to ten combinations that you can have, right? Um, as a myeloma patient, are there? Does that test give you any feel for the um, uh, better or worse prognosis? I know most people have said to me, "Well, being IgG kappa or IgG lambda or IgM or IgA doesn't necessarily give you um, prognostic." information like a deletion 17 or something like that would or do you can you weigh in on that at all does it or is that accurate absolutely so having an isotype which is either an igg kappa or an iga lambda is not associated 
with an adverse outcome. So the intact immunoglobulin isotype is not associated with the, an adverse outcome. Having an abnormal free light is, is associated with an, ab, an adverse outcome, and this was work from the MRC. Mm -hmm. What we have found is that using the heavy light assay, if you look at an IgG kappa patient and they have a very extreme IgG kappa, IgG lambda ratio, or if you look at an IgA lambda patient and they have a very extreme IgA kappa, IgG lambda, Ig lambda ratio, then these patients have a poor outcome compared to those patients whose ratio is not so extreme. And so whilst the absolute isotype doesn't predict outcome, the relationship between the tumor-produced immunoglobulin and the polyclonal normal, normally produced immunoglobulins is actually highly predictive. And there were two papers, one by uh, Professor Joe Bradwell and the other by Professor Heinz Ludwig, who suggested that the heavy light ratio and, and actually the free light ratio as well can give you an indication of the severity of disease because it, it gives you an indication not only of the amount of tumor because of the amount of immunoglobulin being produced, but the impact of that tumor because of how much suppression there is associated with the presence of that tumor. So deletion 17P and, and translocation 414, absolutely adverse risk markers. Isotype, IgG kappa, IgA kappa, IgG lambda, isn't associated or doesn't prog uh, prognosticate in these patients, but understanding the relationship between the monoclonal protein and its polyclonal counterpart, that's highly informative. Okay, so if I had to restate what you just said in lay patient terms, I could say that these tests are trying to determine how much tumor is being produced and what it's crowding out because of how much tumor it's producing. Is that correct? Is that how you would Ab state absolutely. it? Or? Okay. And I, you can add I, to that. I, I, <laughs> sure. I, it's, not, it's not just in how much tumor is or whether the tumor is crowding out, rather. Some tumors might produce quite a small amount of, of monoclonal protein, but have a very big effect on the, on the polyclonal, the normal immune system. And so we, the, we don't understand the relationship between the tumor and its impact on the immunoparesis. And, and actually, if we were to work backwards into monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, actually in, 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 in MOGUS patients, in, in, in MGUS patients, uh, comparatively few have uh, immunoparesis, but those patients that do have immunoparesis and those patients that have immunoparesis measured by the heavy light assay have an increased tendency to transform into myeloma. So the, the tumor can have an impact irrespective of its bulk, and that's something that's very new and exciting about this the, the heavy light assay because it's giving us a, a hitherto hidden insight into the biology of monoclonal clones. Okay, that makes more sense. So when you talk about minimal residual disease, and um, we've heard that term a lot, but I think a lot of patients may not completely understand the importance of it or why it matters. So can you kind of give us a, your take on um, why minimal residual disease is so important? Okay, so if we were to go back into the uh, in, into the history books, a complete response in in myeloma was a greater than seventy percent reduction of the of the monoclonal protein. And then, as we became as we have improved tests in the immunofixation um, electrophoresis test, then we can start to say that. Uh, a, a response is a, a, a clearance of the monoclonal protein by immunofixation. An, inc an increased sensitivity in the ability to detect for the tumor would then be the free light assay. And then we say, actually, 
the, a better response than just having a negative immunofixation is by having a normal free light chain ratio. And we can add to this by then looking at flow cytometry and say, well, if we can't detect any tumor cells by flow, flow cytometry, this is a, a step further in our understanding of how much tumor is left or, or whether we have eradicated the disease. You see, minimal residual disease and response is relative to the test that you are using. If your test is, is, is insensitive, then the amount of tumor that you've cleared is, 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 is indicated only by the sensitivity of that test. Excitingly, we are, in a, we are in a phase with our technology where we have very, very, very sensitive tests to identify very small numbers of monoclonal clones. And this can either be done with the serum tests, um, the free light assay and the heavy light assay, flow cytometry, or by looking at imaging. And it, it's, it, it seems a very obvious statement, but the less tumor you can identify by the most sensitive technique, the better the patient's outcome will be. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I really completely understood it until I had a conversation with Dr. Landgren, who was talking about minimal residual disease. And when he explained that it matters and it's relevant because it depends what you do next. Um, for example, he was saying you could take a patient who had an extremely good response and all these tests, um, the free light, the heavy light, the uh, flow cytometry, the imaging, maybe the gene expression profiling, and then you see um, you're measuring response with earlier tests, and then you know what do you do next? How do you treat the patient? Do you go for a more aggressive therapy because they're not responding well or because or less aggressive therapy because they are responding well? Um, once he started talking about it in those terms, it started the light started going on for me about why minimal residual disease is so important because then they can craft a very specific plan um, and, you know, I, it seems that many myeloma patients have been treated in much the same way over the last 20 years, I would say, um, with the same drugs and in the same approach. And it just seemed like it was a new, it opened up a whole new window to a new method of treatment. Uh, absolutely. And uh, speaking with Dr. Langren after his ASH presentation, last year at ASH he presented that the changes in the monoclonal protein using the heavy light assay were the most sensitive uh, serum markers or serum indicators of response compared to standard electrophoretic techniques. And when speaking with uh, Dr. Langren um, Atash, he was saying that for the first time, myeloma doctors have a choice because of the, 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 the next generation of treatment, the Velcade inhibitors, um, sorry, the proteasome inhibitors in Velcade, the monoclonal antibodies, Revlimid. There's now a, a, a whole plethora of different treatments that are targeting different aspects of the myeloma um, and, its, and, and its surrounding environment, which means that the tests that you use to identify whether a patient is responding earlier or, or, or whether a patient is not responding give you an opportunity to then change that treatment. So I agree wholeheartedly with uh, Dr. Landrum. Well, I would have to add to that and just say they can only change the treatment that you have if you are working with an expert myeloma doctor <laughs> because um, there are many doctors that may not know what to do with that additional information, even though it gets some people like you and some of the myeloma specialists very excited to have that level of detail, unless you have a doctor that knows what to do with that information, um, you know they may not may or may not be able to act on it. Uh, I think so. one of the, uh, the the commitments from the International Myeloma Working Group is to provide guidance to all doctors on how to use tests um, and how to assess uh, minimal residual disease and the opportunities around therapy. 
and they provide consensus opinions and publish these on a routine basis. Yeah, and I know they just had their latest um, meeting in Milan, Italy, which was very helpful. So about this test, how get, now that it was FDA approved, um, where is it available? Um, how would a patient access it? Is it being used regularly in the clinic, or how how does a patient know if they've had this test or ask for this test? So the I believe that in the USA, Mayo Clinic are um, using the test, um, and I think uh, LabCorp are about to start to use the test. Um, there are numerous sites that have been evaluating the tests, including the NIH, um, and the sites we mentioned earlier. Because the assays were only recently FDA approved, it's not available in all fa facilities. But I think part of the, the, the um, improvement or part of the um, improvement in, in patient understanding is that patients and physicians should be able to discuss the merits of how their protein is assessed and then identify the laboratories to run the test. In Europe, the test is used in Germany and in the UK um, and, and, and in sites in France and Italy. How and do you how, know whether it's... Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I think it's about whether the laboratory and the physician have the discussion on how they want to monitor the patients as to whether you would know the heavy light or the free light assay had been used. And if if you're measuring the presence of a tumor burden or the amount of tumor burden, I would think you would need to use the test multiple times at different stages in your therapy. Is that true? Well, every clinical study and physician has their own protocol. And of course, patients and physicians should discuss how often they should be monitored during the course of their treatment. Um, essentially, every time a patient is monitored, the heavy light or the free light assay could be used in the same way one might order electrophoresis or immunofixation. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, all, it's very dependent on whether there is a, a clinical trial protocol or whether the pa or how the patient and the physician are discussing the approach to their monitoring. And just to put it in perspective, because you've already given us kind of the purpose of it, but if you give it in perspective with the other tests, like um, the, some of the gene expression profiling, you're, the, these might be done once, mm -hmm. and if you are monitoring, you know, let's say you've gone through your course of therapy, you'd want to want to monitor it beforehand and after. So it just seems to me, just from listening to you, that it might be something you would want to ask your doctor about regularly. Now, how um, is this an expensive test to request, or and do you know if insurance uh, pays for this test? Cur currently, I. I don't think that we have uh, reimbursement. I um, I'm not entirely sure. The cost of the test, I'm afraid I'm a, a, I am the director of R&D, so I don't actually mm -hmm. know in different countries how much the test would cost, but this is a comparatively cheap test compared to, for instance, um, gene profiling, which is thousands of dollars. This is certainly um, not in thousands of dollars. Um, is in, in is in you know a ten dollar test for instance although um, that's a you know a, a very loose figure um, mm -hmm. with respect to frequency myeloma patients disease is monitored by by um, blood tests on a routine basis and the way patients responses are assigned is by changes in these blood tests and th this is the international myeloma working group's response assignment so if one had a very good partial response, that would be a, a, a greater than 90% reduction in the monoclonal protein as measured by serum protein electrophoresis from presentation to the point of evaluation. The heavy light test can be used in exactly the same way. And there was recently a publication in the, um, at the IFCC that showed that changes in the heavy light value could be used as in exactly the same way as changes in the monoclonal protein measured by serum protein electrophoresis. 
So it's a very easy to, easy to use test, and because it doesn't require uh, bone marrow aspirates or, comp or, or, or prolonged imaging, um, it's a simple blood draw, it's actually quite a, a, an accessible test too, um, in the same way that the free light assay is, is a very accessible test. Okay, great. And you mentioned you began this test just testing the IgG, which is the most common type of heavy chain, but now that it's available for IgA and IgM, or is it just IgG for now? Um, we have FDA approval for IgG, IgA, and IgM. The FDA approval for IgG and IgA is actually it's, it's a test that's approved to monitor myeloma patients, so to monitor the changes in monoclonal protein in myeloma patients. The IgM test is approved only to measure the protein, and that that is because we have at the binding site uh, done substantial uh, clinical studies to compare the utility of the IgG and IgA assays in monitoring myeloma patients compared to standard tests. And we are very pleased that the FDA agreed that this assay provided a sensitive tool for monitoring. Okay. Great. Now, with your expertise on um, polyclonal antibodies, that's your background, and monoclonal antibodies, can you give us your opinion about these newer options? You mentioned it at the beginning, like daratumumab and elotuzumab in myeloma. Um, can you tell us where you see that future heading, and have there ever been any polyclonal antibodies developed which are targeting multiple antibodies. I know they're starting with monoclonal, which is a single, <laughs> but um, yep. do, you, do you see it ever being so, expanded? So perhaps it's it might be worthwhile explaining to um, the listeners what the difference between a polyclonal and monoclonal antibody is, and then to explain why therapeutically we choose monoclonal antibodies, but in in vitro diagnostics, we genuinely choose polyclonal antibodies. That'd be great. So, so polyclonal antibodies are mixtures of antibodies that, eat, that, that um, recognize different epitopes. We started the discussion, we started today by, by discussing um, plasma cells, and plasma cells produce antibodies, and, and we as human beings, uh, we produce thousands and uh, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of different antibodies against bacteria and each of these antibodies recognize a different epitope and that's called poly which means many clonal many different clones many different antibodies recognizing many different epitopes a monoclonal antibody is where we isolate a single clone and we remove it from the rest of the the, the clones and we, we immortalize it in a, process, in a hybridization process, and then that plasma cell becomes an immortal plasma cell, but it only ever produces a single antibody. Now, historically, polyclonal antibodies um, were used in diagnostic tests because in the in diagnostic test, you want your diag diagnostic test to recognize as many different patients as possible. If we think about the, the free light assay for a moment, the and Anderson and Anderson said there were a million or more different immunoglobulins in the body, which means there are a million or more different light chains present within the body. And that means that you want a test that recognizes many of those different uh, as many of those different light chains as possible because each of them will be unique and you need a lot of uh, recognition to make sure you you cover all of the possible um, epitopes and all of the possible um, amino acid sequences within those light chains. If you were to use a monoclonal antibody, you would only recognize a single um, epitope or a single sequence within the light chains, and that may or may not be present in the light chain that you are testing. Mm -hmm. So. From an in vitro diagnostics point of view, you use a polyclonal approach, which is to identify as many as possible. 
therapeutically, you actually want to use a monoclonal approach. And that is because you want to use an approach where you have a very strong control over the epitope that your antibody is binding to, for instance, anti-CD38 or anti-CD20, and you want to be able to reproducibly produce this antibody because you have to grow it as a clone, and you perhaps couldn't do that from a polyclonal approach. And so if we think about whether polyclonal antibodies may ever be used in therapeutics, well, actually polyclonal antibodies are used in therapeutics. If, um, if patients are given IV, Ig are given intravenous immunoglobulins. That is polyclonal antibodies that have been taken from healthy blood donors. And monoclonal antibodies are where we use a specific antibody to target a specific epitope to give a specific response. So we do use polyclonal antibodies. They're not quite used in quite the same way as the anti-tumor antibodies but certainly are, are, are useful therapeutic options. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're testing for everything. And the monoclonal antibodies like geratumumab or SAR or elotuzumab that are out right now are targeting one specific thing, like either CS1 or um, CD38 and those types of things. Uh, ab absolutely. And so in, in in vitro diagnostics terms, it's very important to use a polyclonal approach because your antibodies in your light chains will be as unique as we are. From a therapeutic point of view, you want to identify a single point, a single uh, clone or a single target to be able to reproducibly use it as a as a as a drug. So the the, the two systems are very different. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. And I, now I want to open it up for our caller questions because I have, um, we have some callers on the phone. So if you have a question for Dr. Harding, please call 347-637-2631 and press 1 on your keypad. Okay, our first caller question, please go ahead. Oh, <clears throat> well, hi, uh, Dr. Hardy and Paul. And uh, this is Paul and Jenny. Thank you for taking the call. Uh, question, uh, I, I listened to the show and, and as the you know, patients and caregivers, this is still pretty complicated stuff for us. Uh, so <clears throat> I understand the importance of a stringent complete outcome. And, and now the, the previous tests can identify, you know, a stringent or complete outcome. Can you help me understand how this test that you're talking about, this new heavy light test, is a an additional indicator for this contingent, this uh, stringent complete outcome? Is it? Is there? Is there really additional information that you're gathering? Um, and what's the benefit to us as as patients? Okay. So th thank you very much for the question. It, it, it's a really great question. The standard assessment of complete response using immunofixation has a sensitivity of around about between 200 milligrams per, per liter to 500 milligrams per liter. And will only tell you whether your monoclonal component has fallen below that level. The heavy light assay will give you an indication both of your how your monoclonal protein has reduced but will also tell you about the recovery of your polyclonal proteins. And the recovery of the polyclonal gives you an indication that a healthy immune system has, 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 been, has started to recolonize or, or, or to, um, to, to regrow after, after treatment. Okay, so, the, so, so then the, 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 dif the difference is that my, the previous test just tell me if there's no cancer. This test tells me if I have a healthy regrowing immune system so the the recovery of my body after the disease um, absolutely the, the monoclonal components or the involved heavy light will tell you if with the the cancer immunoglobulin has reduced and the polyclonal component which is a new insight into myeloma biology 
seems to give an indication on whether the, the immune system is regrown and whether the patient has, has, has responded. Um, now, it, it's worth pointing out there have been publications which support uh, this hypothesis, but this is not um, yet been 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 shown or um, been indicated uh, been included in any clinical study, um, and so it's 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 very much a, a, a experimental observation. But as you know, as a patient wanting to get as much information about our disease, you know, this is helpful. Does this give me some kind of a an indication of how my cancer is trending. So if I can look at, does this tell me, you know, the, does this tell me that I am, I am, uh, have a, what's the hope here? I know, can't, I know you can't say what it is, but is the hope that it's showing me that I am not only in remission, but then my body is heading towards, back towards a normal state, or what am I hoping to figure out at the end of the day on, on this test? So the the Black Swan Research Initiative has is used free light and, and or has included free light and heavy light alongside standard uh, standard assessments of response because we believe it a whole battery of tests that will help us understand the complexities of myeloma and myeloma is a, a hugely complex disease. I think what you're hoping to see is that, in very simplistic terms. One would anticipate if you have a normal kappa lambda ratio by free light and a normal kappa lambda ratio and IgG kappa, IgG lambda ratio, IgA kappa, IgA lambda ratio, etc., then that gives you an indication that your body has returned to, a, as you say, a more normal state. And we're still involved in the experimental clinical studies to prove those hypotheses. Um, but that's certainly what we're looking for. We're looking to see whether the test adds value in giving an indication both of the reduction in the, the tumor load by the, the monoclonal protein reduction and also in the immunological recovery by looking at the polyclonal um, immu immunoglobulin elevation. Uh, is there a... Is this... Is this part of an ongoing medical trial that patients can participate in? Or is the trial already completed and, and, and approved by the FDA? It's an in vitro diagnostic test, so you, we don't have the sort of trials that you're, you're talking um, about in the same way that you have a drug trial where you can enroll. But there are a number of uh, clinical studies in, in sites around the U.S. and Europe which are evaluating the test. Um, and a number of sites that are evaluating the test, including um, Mayo Clinic, um, NIH, Dana Farber, etc. Um, I think if you were to uh, contact the binding site um, office in San Diego, they may be able to help direct you to where somebody is able to to, uh, to have this test run over in the United States. The okay, FDA that, that, was, have that, was, looked that was my last question, but go, go ahead. Would the FDA have looked at the data that binding sites submitted, which compared the use of the, the heavy light assay to standard um, methods of monitoring patients? And their approval is that they found that the assay had been proved to be substantially equivalent to the standard method, which is why we received our 510K approval. Okay. My last, my last question is, uh, as, a, as a patient, Help me understand, how do I talk to my doctor about getting this test? Will my doctor be okay with that? As, as, a, as, a, as a biochemist and um, as somebody not over in the United States, all I would suggest is that you could talk to your doctor about the method that he is using to monitor the monoclonal protein or your monoclonal immunoglobulin. And then there are publications um, that have been presented at ASH and in Leukemia Journal alongside um, educational material from the binding site in San Diego, which could then be used to share and discuss with it, with your physician. Jenny, can you provide those links to us so we could use those with our doctors? Oh, sure. I'd be happy to. I'll include it as part of the show transcript. All right. Thank you, uh, thank you Jenny, and, 
and also thank you, Dr. Harding. Appreciate your taking the time with us and asking dumb questions. <laughs> they, they, were, they, they were very great. They were very good questions. Thanks very much. All right, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you for your question. Our next question caller is at ninety three six seven five seven. Please go ahead with your question. Hi, Jenny. Um, hi, Dr. Harding. It's a pleasure to speak to you. This is Dana Holmes, and hey, Dana. Um, I have a question for you or two, actually. Um, I, I heard that you you noted that those with immunoparesis have the increased tendency to progression. I'm smoldering multiple myeloma, and I have some immunoparesis that I know of from the immunoglobulin, uh, quantitative immunoglobulin uh, tests that are done on me in my IgA. I'm IgG kappa, and I'm presuming that my um, IgG is equally suppressed because that's where my monoclonal protein is found. Um, so I would imagine this type of test would be very valuable for me to establish my risk to progression. And um, I realize that some centers are currently using it in the U.S., as you noted, um, but I'm wondering if many of the clinicians are still looking at it at this point as more of an investigational tool and not yet ready for general use. Is Could that be a potential reason why we're not seeing it being um, moved into the clinic for everyday use at this point, particularly for someone in my situation? Hi, well, th thank you very much for your question, and it's a pleasure to talk to you. I know we've exchanged some uh, tweets. Yes, um, yes, we have, Dr. <laughs> Harding. Yes, thank you so much for that. Um, so you're right. The, the assay is only recently launched in the U.S. Um, from FDA approval, and so it's still very much in the, um, the experimental phase or the investigational phase. Although I think that the work that's been that's come out of Mayo Clinic and out of the NIH is is, is showing a genuine utility. There has been no studies um, looking at smoldering myeloma with with heavy light. Um, although I'm sure you know that the free light assay is very important in smoldering myeloma as a as a marker of progression, and, mm -hmm. and certainly ratios above 100 are. Are, are considered to be um, very informative. Um, so, th the, unfortunately, I don't think there's enough evidence or enough um, work that's been done in smoldering to understand whether the assay has a utility in that specific uh, indication or not. What we do know is that in the setting of monoclonal gammopathy, the level of suppression that uh, was evident, it was a marker of transformation into myeloma and we do know in myeloma the level of suppression is a, is a, is a indication of the severity of the disease. Um, what what I think we should do, and, and and this is something that I'm certainly pleased to do from binding site, is to see whether we can identify trials of smoldering myeloma patients or uh, physicians who have a number of smoldering myeloma patients in order to start that experimental work. I would um, welcome your support of that within the myeloma community because, quite frankly, I, I think and I see it as a very important test, and I would love as a smoldering patient to be able to um, be able to access that, so whether it be done in, in, a, in a trial or otherwise. Um, so I would welcome that, and I'll keep my eyes open, certainly, for your tweets about it. Um, I have another question concerning immunoparesis. If you have that at the start of treatment, can you eventually see immune reconstitution to normal levels after treatment, or is once the immune system is, is suppressed, that's it? it? It really will never kind of bump back up, and, and you'll see normal levels of the immunoglobulins, of the normal polyclonal so, immunoglobulins. So in, in looking at the heavy light data that we've evaluated so far and in publications from Professor Heinz Ludwig from um, the Wilhelmina Hospital in Vienna. Almost all, well, a large majority of myeloma patients present with um, some degree of, of immunosuppression uh, using the heavy light assay. Um, but this immunosuppression recovers as the patient responds, and when the patient uh, has a complete response, 
or a stringent complete response, the levels of the uninvolved immunoglobulin seem to be approaching normal. So I think the immune system can recover once we have alleviated the burden of the of the myeloma tumor. I see. And the heavy light would be able to um, give you some insight as to how your immune system is actually um, recovering. Well, that's what we hope. We mm-hmm. and, and that's our, the indication of the, the data that's been presented today. Um, Binding Sites has got a, a strong commitment into understanding and, and supporting um, m- patients with monoclonal gammopathy and trying to find out the best possible um, tests in order to ev- evaluate the disease. Um, we're very keen to, to, to understand what other tests we may be, um, may be useful in the setting of immune recovery. And, and that's an area of focus. I hope in the in the next uh, few years we may be able to be discussing other tests looking at immunoreconstitution. Okay. And and lastly, Dr. Harding, if you please, um, my question is related to the heavy light assay and how it can be applied to a biclonal process. Um, it, not so much that conventional biclonal, the IgA kappa to IgM lambda, but more in the, uh, the sense of the same isotope. I personally have a biclonal IgG kappa. I'm showing two bands on IFE, but only one has a prominent M spike. So really I only see the one M spike. But I do have an abnormal free light chain as well. So I'm wondering, would the heavy light shed some additional light on my disease process in any way? Well, the, the, if, you, if you have, if I'm understood correctly, you have two IgG kappa clones? Yes. Is it, was that, yeah. so that, and and, uh, and that's based like upon that. the results from the immunofixation, the IFE. It, it clearly states that there is a second band. Yeah. Right. So, so the heavy light assay would be able to identify both of those clones and would report it as a single value. Uh, i.e. The, 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 the degree of IgG kappa that was present within um, the serum. Um, and we would also then, the second test, the IgG lambda test, would be able to report the degree of polyclonal IgG lambda that was present in the serum. So the, the assay can be used to, to, to quantify all of the G kappa and, and all of the G lambda. One of the areas where we're seeing some utility for free light and heavy light um, to be run alongside one another is in the setting of patients who have some clonal evolution. Um, and for the first time, we're understanding that clones are a, 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 a much evolving um, scenario rather than being a, st- a stable scenario. And so I think evaluation of the G kappa, the G lambda, and the free kappa would give some indication of, 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 of the disease process. Okay. Very, very good. Thank you so very much. It really was a pleasure. Thank you, Jenny, for, again, giving us this platform to um, oh. speak directly to the experts. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Dana, for your question. Okay, we also had an email then question by Susan. She had she says, I have the kind of myeloma with no M-spike non-secretor. Would this test be relevant for people with this kind of myeloma? Would it better be better for follow-up than the usual kappa-lambda ratio test? Uh, that that is a great question. Um, we simply haven't looked at enough non-secretory myeloma patients to know whether it adds value. There's only been a very small study done in Leicester in the UK, um, and there it seemed that 20% of the patients that had non-secretory um, myeloma had an abnormal heavy light ratio, but we have no data to suggest whether it can be used to monitor these patients. So I'm afraid it's just too early in the lifespan of the test to understand its its role. Um, but what, as we do know, of course, the free light assay identifies a number of these patients and is actually recommended in international myeloma working group guidelines as a tool to monitor non-secretory or oligosecretory patients. Okay, great, very helpful. Well, Dr. Harding, thank you so much for explaining this test to us. Sometimes this information can be pretty overwhelming because there are so many different ways of doing the diagnostics. So it's very, very helpful for you to explain 
how the tests work and what they do and why they're important. And I believe this is an important test, so thank you. Well, th thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, the binding site has a, a commitment to continue, continue education for both uh, physicians, patients, and laboratorians. And so we produce documents for patients um, as well as as, as aim at doctors, and these should be able to be obtained from the office in, in, in over in the United States. We appreciate how difficult this is, and, and 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 hopefully they provide some use for the patients. Well, it's very helpful, and I will include it on the transcript. But we very much appreciate your research and the work that you're doing, especially as um, to create assays that are blood tests <laughs> and not bone marrow biopsies. That's it's very helpful to us. So we are gr very, very grateful for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to another episode of Innovation in Myeloma. Join us next week for our next inpatient radio interview as we learn more about how we as patients can help drive to a cure for myeloma by joining clinical trials. Ryan here and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like are you a fist pumper, a woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver? I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino-style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly plus free daily bonuses, so don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW report prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18+. Plus.